Good morning. It's a uh, good way to start a good morning to uh, rejoice in our Savior and the story of redemption and life and hope that we find in Jesus. And uh, we are in a series kind of winding down. Last week will be our last week. Um, simply called Jesus Saves. Uh, Jesus Saves. And we've looked at different spaces, uh, different types of folks uh, that Jesus Saves. But I want to start today with a question, a legitimate question, I think. Uh, Jesus saves from what? So the idea of saving, um, in my experience, means there's something out there from which I'm saving. And I haven't uh, shared a good Paco story with you in a while. Uh, just to give you an update, our dog... Uh, who is uh, dearly loved and respected by all in our family. Um, He has had to be saved uh, several times. And I want to tell you these two stories um, and then kind of relate it back to our topic this morning. Apaco, if you haven't seen a picture of him, if you haven't met him, if you haven't seen me draw stuff up here uh, that looks nothing like him, uh, Paco is a little silky terrier that we call a hand-me-down dog uh, because we never wanted Paco, and yet Paco ended up in our lives. And he's been with us since Sienna was born, so they've grown up together, uh, which is kind of interesting. When Sienna was two years old, uh, we called them, her and Paco, the terrible two, uh, because both of them were, were just crazy uh, trying to keep track of um, anyway, uh, I would bring Paco to work every so often. I, I still do, um, but uh, I brought him over. It was at the time that Stacy and Chris were living upstairs. So I brought Paco over, and uh, I'm in Bonnie's office uh, with this little dog, and I notice that Chris and Stacy's cat is on the other couch in the office. And uh, those of you who own cats... Um, I don't understand why, but those of you who own cats, uh, you know when that tail sticks up, the back end is up, and all the hairs are raised up, like, things are not going to go well. And sure enough, the cat's name actually was Sienna, which is interestingly ironic. Sienna is raised up, staring at my dog, and here's one of the realities I know. Sienna the cat could dismember my dog in a matter of seconds. No question, right? Not really a fair fight there, even though Sienna was half Paco's size. And so I see the cat, and she's about to launch and get Paco. And so as she's kind of launching off the couch, I grab the cat. Yes, uh, she had not been declawed. Um, and I ended up trying to get to the door with this cat who's now frantic. She thinks I'm attacking her, but she's already got her attention up because she wanted the dog. And I end up opening the door, uh, tossing Sienna out, closing it, to then look at my arms. And um, maybe the worst thing I had to endure was my family for the next few months singing cat scratch fever to me. And it was a mess, but um, it, it was interesting. It, it bonded, which is weird to say. Are we recording this for evidence? It bonded me and Paco in a new way. Like after he recognized, not that I don't think dogs really think this way, if I'm honest with you, they're dogs. Um, But it it seemed like Paco uh, came to me more in a a new kind of way, like, wow, you're my rescuer, you're my hero. And I still didn't like him any more than before. Uh, But my second saving story, that one was clear, like Sienna was out to uh, get him. I I saved Paco uh, from the Libby's cat. Um, The other one was this year, uh, maybe the end of, of last year. Uh, we were walking Paco down the road, and 
Uh, Paco, he doesn't have a whole lot of uh, common sense. Um, so he's a little dog, and if you have a little dog, you know this complex that little dogs have. They see a big dog, and they can't just walk by like, oh, look, it's a big dog. Good morning. <laughs> Instead, they, they go in attack mode like, yes, I want to take this big Doberman down, and I can do it. And everyone else in the entire world is looking at that scenario saying, you're just snack for that thing. Like, what are you doing? So sure enough, my dog starts going, pulling it at the leash. And there's a, a big dog. I, I don't know what kind it was. It, it was dark out. Um, but he kind of caught, obviously, on the other side of the street. This little dog is barking at him. And he launches for him. Well, the guy had a good hold on the leash because he kind of saw it coming, too. We, we both saw this scenario unfolding. So he, he grabs hold of the leash really, really well, except the dog broke the collar. That's how much he wanted Paco for snack. <laughs> and now I see this big dog running towards my dog, and I'm holding his leash. And um, We played this scene out how many times um, in, in story in our family. Okay, I've got my dog who's trying to launch towards this big dog. A big dog now uh, unleashed, running at my little dog, and, and this one thought hit me. You can imagine, right? I need to save Paco again. So this time, I just instinctually grabbed the leash and pulled him as hard as I could away from the other dog. Well, Paco doesn't weigh that much. <laughs> and my kids are watching the scene unfold and he literally goes airborne, and while he's in the air, I turn with the leash in very quick motion, and Paco makes this half circle in the air until he's behind me, and then I can grab the dog, and the owner's running, it, and it was all good, and we laughed about that, but I saved Paco twice, which put some kind of badge on me. I'm not sure what badge that is, but... But when I think about those kind of fun stories, um, they're kind of packed in our vault. They come out every so often. Um, it is clear to me when there's a danger around and, and a pet, certainly sons and daughters, right? Uh, some of you could share stories that aren't humorous about coming in to save, to rescue a son and a daughter out of a very precarious place that they might have been, because you saw the threat. You knew what they needed saving from, or perhaps it was a spouse, a friend. Which brings us back to our question. We celebrate that Jesus saves. But what is he saving from? Here's some examples of what I do not believe Jesus saves us from. Uh, Jesus does not save us from a hard life. I mean, if we're honest with each other, I think I would vote for that one. Like, I, I would like rescue from that. And, and we have promises that in the kingdom to come, in Jesus' good age, when he's reigning as king, these hard things disappear. But in this life, you're promised that you'll face hard things. Uh, Jesus doesn't save us from a hard life. Uh, we don't promote at FCCB what's called a prosperity gospel. That if you follow Jesus and you have enough faith, everything can be yours. The good life can be yours. Uh, we don't teach that because we have promises from Jesus that in this world we will have trouble. It's followed by another promise. So take heart. I've overcome the world. But the idea that we're going to navigate through life and it for some of us, maybe for all of us, some parts of life are going to be hard. Jesus is not rescuing us from that. Here's another one that I would cast a vote for, if I had one. Uh, Jesus does not rescue us or save us from conflict. Some of us, I think there's very, very few of us, but some of us thrive in conflict. I, I think you seek it. Somehow the, 
the adrenaline in there, the, the nature of it. You, you're just kind of drawn to it. But the vast majority of us hate conflict. Like, I literally um, would choose a life of playing Frisbee with people out on the, the trail, talking about the goodness of God and enjoying life. And that, to me, is beautiful. I don't need conflict. But as you know, conflict finds a way to you. Some of which I begin, whether it's intentional or unintentional. Other types of conflict, others begin, and I'm drawn in for various reasons. So much of God's Word in the New Testament, you know what it's written to address? Conflict. Why is that? Because Jesus' church is filled with people with selfish interests. And in that church, in that community, there will be conflict. As my agenda conflicts with your agenda, and off we go. And the question is not, is Jesus going to save us from conflict? No. The question is, will we follow Jesus' way through conflict together? Jesus is not here to save us from difficult relationships, from conflict. Nor is he here to save us from negative feelings, sickness, uh, your in-laws. Jesus is not saving us from all these things. But if you think back to the Christmas narrative that we were in not too long ago, um, and all of a sudden it, it begins washing over us. You shall call his name Jesus. Because he will save his people from their sins. And all of a sudden, we begin to see Jesus is saving us from our sins. Or another way that we might be able to faithfully express that is Jesus saves us from ourselves. Which is really interesting. We have an enemy that's out to destroy, a lie, and kill. But we have an enemy within that the Bible calls our flesh. And man, that thing wants to run after whatever pleases me. And I have my own self-interest, and I have my own path that I want to walk. And the end of that path, the wages of that path, called sin, is death. And Jesus comes. He says, you don't need to follow your own way. You don't need to follow sin. And so Jesus, on a cross, in his death, pays that debt that we incurred by ourselves, by our sin. And he bears the weight of the entire human race. And then he offers, those who come to me, I give the gift of life, forgiveness, redemption. Jesus saves, when we use that phrase, he is saving us, from ourselves. He's saving his people from their sin. And so we've looked. Uh, There's been a prostitute in the middle of the Pharisees uh, recklessly worshiping Jesus. And uh, we got to ponder that Jesus saves the wayward, those of us who choose ways in life that are just hard and kind of on the fringes and we never envisioned it, but off we go over here. And Jesus comes and saves them from themselves. We also looked at uh, the story of Saul on the way to Damascus and consider that even the reluctant, those who are resistant to the good news of Jesus, Jesus still comes and saves the reluctant from themselves. And last week, I think the hardest group of people that Jesus desires to even save the self-righteous religious, as he shares a story of a father and a prodigal son. And uh, we kind of zoomed in on the older brother and saw the dad outside pleading with the older brother, the self-righteous guy who's like, wait, I've been here the whole time. I've done everything right. You haven't even given me a little goat. And the father's out there pleading, come in. I want you inside. I love you. Everything I've had has always been yours. Come. And join the celebration for that which was lost is found. My son who is dead is alive. 
And this week, we get not just places in life, but this grand theme that runs through all of Scripture, that Jesus will save from every tribe and every nation and every tongue on the face of this earth. That Jesus desires salvation to come, not just to people who are in a difficult place in life or reluctant or self-righteous, but if you live and you speak a different language and you have a different culture, Jesus is popping in saying, salvation is from you because you need to be saved from yourself as well. God of the Bible is the God of the universe, and he has always been intent on having folks from every tribe and every nation on earth worship Him and love Him. So I don't know how often you picture this, uh, but today, and and today is kind of ish, in that today is now yesterday for some, and it's tomorrow for others, and some worship on Saturday. But in a general sense, today, there are folks in... Uh, the coronavirus epicenter of China worshiping Jesus because he saves. There are folks in the plains of Africa singing their songs of worship to the Savior of the world, as well as not only deep in the Amazon jungles, but in Pyongyang, North Korea, under incredible threat and incredible persecution, the song of the redeemed is coming out. Jesus saves from every tribe, every conceivable setting, the persecuted, those who are free, the urbanites, the villagers. Jesus is saving and gathering people to worship him from every tongue and every tribe on the earth. And I think a good picture of this (coughs) is the idea that... um, Christianity gets criticized over the years, uh, maybe perhaps rightly so in some cases, but generally criticized that, hey, you can't uh, take over someone's culture with this Western religion of yours. And uh, I think a better picture for us is that Jesus, in his effort to save, when the good news is proclaimed that God is for them, and God forgives them, and God saves them from themselves, that in response to that, people are willingly and excitedly laying their cultural treasures down before the culture maker, saying, you can have it all, Lord. All my history and all my story and all my important things, I lay them before the cross. For you to sanctify, for you to change. And it's happening all over the earth. I want to take us to Revelation chapter 7, if you can turn there. Uh, Revelation is the last book in the Bible, so it's fairly easy to find. Uh, Revelation chapter 7, beginning in verse 9. So the whole book of Revelation is, I don't know, some of you have had a similar experience. I haven't. Uh, God has not given me that, this kind of, of giftedness. But some of you have had the experience of, uh, you go into worship, maybe it's personal, in your backyard or your sacred space. Maybe it's here together uh, with saints at church. But you've had the experience, you go to worship, and it's like, all of heaven and all of earth become crystal clear. And there's a merger, and you can see and hear what's happening in the heavens, even as you're on earth. It's like a a curtain gets lifted, which is the exact scenario that John had on the island of Patmos. He goes to worship. And in his worship experience, Jesus comes, lifts the veil, and reveals to John what is to come. And there's been countless debates about when is all this going to happen? Is it back then? Is it progressive? Is it out in the future? Um, The answer probably is yes, 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 uh, whatever that might mean. Uh, But in Revelation chapter 7, uh, Jesus gives John this vision, and he goes through 144,000 people 
12,000 from each tribe of Israel. And then in verse 9, we pick up our text. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen! Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. And then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they and where, where do they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And He who sits on the throne will spread His tent over them. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And it's a picture of Jesus' saving work happening in Iran, in Iraq. It's taking place all over Asia and South America. And I have read uh, several books over the past couple years by uh, people that we were labeled missiologists, which is just a fancy way of saying we have scholars in the Christian community who just look at what's happening in mission work around the world. And then they kind of write it and share their thoughts and their data. I've read several books over the past couple of years about it, about the epicenter of Christianity where the Spirit's working that has already moved from the Western world to the Southern Hemisphere. That in South America, there are amazing stories of Jesus saving uh, people from their sins, as there are in Asia, in Africa. And the numbers that they're reporting are explosive. Exploding number of people coming into the family of God. Almost like you can't count the multitude coming in. And this is a, a glorious part of God's plan. That Jesus is saving people from themselves in all of these locations around the world because sin is present even in the most pristine, untouched culture. I, I love if you were here uh, when Nathaniel Schrift was sharing about his village in the Amazon, um, he's like, yeah, it's all PC to say, yeah, these are, are beautiful human beings. Uh, they are, but their culture and their personality is bereft with sin. They steal and they gossip and they lie and it's hard. And he's seeing it firsthand because that's how humanity is. And Jesus is saving from all of these places, all of these groups, all of these cultures. And I want to identify something for us. While that is part of God's glorious plan, and we can celebrate it, it can be hard, too. It can be hard for some of us. Because it means America is not the front and center actor in God's plan. And that can be hard to process. For some of us. Because I think unspoken for many, many years, we've believed precisely that. 
from the foundation of our country that this is the new promised land. And our founding fathers had that a notion on their mind as they wrote. The preachers at the time, their sermons uh, were filled with it, and there absolutely is a hand of God. But America is not the epicenter of God's plan. That can be hard for us. Our national tragedies are not necessarily in prophecy. Because it seems to me, most people I read, when they're interpreting prophecy, they just happen to glance back to our national tragedy. Oh, look, that must be the fulfillment of that prophecy. And uh, I question whether or not our story is really the story that God's been telling all these years. It's hard to think that we might have a backseat to what God is doing on the world. And here's another one. Our enemies, America's enemies, doesn't necessarily make them God's enemies. We are not the center flair to what God is unfolding in this world. And I love this nation. I am thankful, uh, even in the messiness that we often find ourselves, but we're not the focus of God's saving activity. And next week, uh, we'll unpack this a little bit. But we are identified, rather, in Jesus as foreigners and aliens passing through this strange land. That I don't double down on my American identity primarily, as much as I'm proud of that. My identity primarily is I'm one of Jesus' people. I'm just an alien and a foreigner passing through this strange land on my way home. And that home is Jesus. God has raised up empires for his purposes and then disposed as he has pleased for millennia. And we are not the apex of his plan. And if that offends any of you, I I just want to say, if you're offended by that, it doesn't make it less true. And, And we can process that out together if you want. But it's not just America, that the fact that there are people from every tribe and nation that Jesus is saving and gathering together. Uh, But maybe here's an even more relevant truth for you. All right, you ready for this? It's not a shocker, but we just need to identify it. You are not the apex of God's plan. Sorry. So I I want to reassure, because I I feel like I just have to here. Uh, God loves you individually. He knows your name. Uh, It wasn't too long ago that we were blown away together by God knows your street address. Like, he, he can locate you on a map. God's love for you is very, very individual. Um... Probably the stereotypical description that's appropriate to go back to is like the number of hairs on your head personal. He loves you. But you are not the apex or the center of God's plan. Not everybody needs to submit to your will. Not everyone needs to think like you or act like you or sing like you or even pay attention to you. And one of the most freeing choices of a follower of Jesus is to get our eyes off ourselves, our eyes off our own church, our eyes off our own country, and see the cosmic glorious thing that God is doing in every tribe, in every nation around the world. To take the magnifying glass that we tend to put on ourselves as burning a hole in us and look through that magnifying glass out to see the greatness of our God saving 
from every tribe and nation and language. Because it's amazing. Listen to the the worship streaming from people of every color and every background. They're all singing in this passage, salvation belongs to our God. Which is just another way of saying, God, thank you for saving me. Thanks for coming and rescuing me from myself and my sins. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for paying the price. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. It's the song of the redeemed. Like he's doing it even now. And I wonder, because I don't sing well, I wonder what that will sound like. Right? I mean, what happens when the Yankee from New Hampshire is just getting at worship next to the Brazilian urban teenager who is sitting next to the Cambodian rice worker and all of their hearts and souls are just pouring out in worship to Savior? What does that sound like? Or instrumentally, I don't know everything that's going to be in heaven. But I sure do picture some African drum set up there just banging away in worship. I picture some sort of Central American maraca or whatever the, the term is that, that they're using, uh, shaking the, the rhythm of worship together. Whatever instruments they use in the Far East, whatever flute melody is being played in there, and, you know, you've got to also picture in that moment the, the American guy with the bandana and long hair. And his electric guitar, you know, strumming up. And where do I plug this thing in, man? (laughs) It's a cosmic scene of all sorts of colors and faces and stories and backgrounds. All with one message. Jesus saves. And we're so excited to celebrate and worship together. And and I want to maybe close this sermon. Um, I love questions. I I just do. And I don't know the answer to all the questions. And maybe it's because I'm middle-aged. I'm now comfortable. Like, uh, I don't know. Um, I used to try to fabricate an answer. Like, well, I I learned this. And if I throw this big word out, I'll confuse them. And then I'll, like, scamper away and but, but now I'm like, I, I love the question. That's a great question. Let's explore that. I don't know. Um, and there's nothing like having a uh, kid in college um, to bring up questions that you have no idea uh, the answer to. And uh, this Christmas, uh, Ethan and I were speaking about um, actually this kind of theme in terms of other religions. And he asks a question that's been asked for thousands of years. Well, what about those who never hear about Jesus who are in these tribes or unreached people groups? What about them, Dad? And uh, we went to this passage, and it's not like, you know, I locked down the answer. Take that back to Yale, buddy. Here you go. <laughs> but we did explore this, and I want to invite you to, to turn back a little bit to Romans chapter 10. Because there's, I don't know, there's a fire sitting here that um, we ought to be willing to take advantage of, a little spirit motivation that, yeah, that's amazing, but not everyone has heard. Not every language has the Bible and the good news in its language. And it prompts that legitimate question. Well, well, what about those people? What about them? Fortunately, God has addressed us. If we just kind of look at Romans 10, uh, dropped up in verse 9, Paul is writing. um, He's talking about Jesus saving. 
He says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Pretty simple equation there. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame, for there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. We could expand, like uh, click on that Gentile word and have hundreds and hundreds of subcategories of what a Gentile is. Even some of the unreached people groups. For there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And right there is our worship and we're celebrating. Yes, Jesus saves in every tribe, every nation. And then Paul asks the question. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? Startling question, Paul. Is it magic? Is it some sort of cosmic uh, fairy dust that God just sprinkles and, wow, they never heard the good news, but hey, they're saved too. So he goes on. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless FCCB is utterly committed to the worldwide mission of Jesus Christ and we give our prayer and we give our resources and we give our talents to those who are going to go that we would send? Right? And I look at this equation saying, wow, I mean, that's logical and simple. Someone needs to send so that that person can go and preach, so that those people can hear, so that those people can believe. It's that simple. We send, they preach, they hear, they believe. Jesus gains a worshiper. But the whole thing starts with the sending. How beautiful, then, are the feet of those who bring good news. I want to put this out out here this morning. Uh, Our church is, I don't know, we're probably lower mid-size or somewhere mid-size for our area. Uh, We're not small, but we're certainly not large. We're we're somewhere in this middle ground. Um, For the number of people that gather together here and call FCCB family, you have amazing gifts. I am amazed time after time what FCCB together, as we share our gifts with each other, I am amazed at what the body is equipped for. And I say that because FCCB does not need to be on the sideline of this mission of God. Nor do I believe we simply have the shrifts in the Amazon and we're sending some money. And it's actually beyond that. We have a deep winding of our hearts with the shrifts. But we don't need to say, hey, look, that's what we're doing. We can celebrate that. But do you know how close the campus of UNH is to us? Do you guys remember the days that we spent time with their international students? And the joy that we had as a family, because there was some gospel and good news that was going to the ends of the earth through our connection with some of the international students. It's like we have the world 10 miles from us. And it just makes me wonder, are we passionate, am I passionate as a pastor, to send and to preach? I don't know what the age is, there's probably no particular age, but certainly the younger generations among us, I think those of us in the older generations, I don't know, we have this responsibility 
it's joyful, it's exciting, but it, it's also simply a responsibility to pass on to younger generations that fire that Jesus saves and he's saving from every tribe and every nation and he wants you to be a part. And it may be in the sending. It may be the preaching. It may be the believing. But as we raise our kids and our young adults we're discipling, I just kind of think that ought to be somewhere on our radar. Because FCCB is good, but we're not great. It's not like we need to devote all of our time and all of our resources to the programs we have going on, or to argue about the latest preference, or I want this, they want that, and let's just have some conflict about that. It, there's this beautiful picture of what Jesus is doing around the world that FCCB has the invitation to be a part of. And, and I find that brilliantly freeing. God, thank you that your people get to be a part of your worldwide mission. Jesus saves from every tribe and every nation. It's colorful. It's loud. And I find it so exciting that we get to be a part of it by praying, by writing, by sending, by loving, even by sharing meals together. Because I'm not the epicenter of God's plan. And that might be the healthiest reminder for me this morning. <laughs> I am not the epicenter of God's plan. Nor are you. Nor is FCCB. Nor is America. God's plan is bigger and better than that. He's on a global mission to bless and to bring worshipers into his church. And we'll just leave with the question, what part might we have? What part might you have? Uh, we're going to have communion together uh, after we pray. And uh, I've always said communion has all sorts of different elements to it. And sometimes we uh, press into the repentance piece. Sometimes it's the wedding banquet. Um, I can't imagine a better um, aspect of the Lord's meal that we could think of than there's one Lord and one faith and one bread. There's one table. And it's this table that's feeding the Jesus worshipers around the world. The body and the blood of a Savior that was broken and spilled for people like us people like the North Koreans and Iranians. And there are millions of people sharing this meal together, celebrating the same Lord as you and I. So let me close in prayer. I'll invite uh, Bruce and Bruce and Dan, if you want to come up to the piano. Uh, we'll hand out communion, and then uh, we'll celebrate together. Father, your vision, your heart, your desires are so much bigger than ours. Uh, your plans are so much better than ours. And even as we mention the shrifts uh, this morning, uh, we pray for them on the front line of translating your word into an unreached people group. But God, we also lift up uh, the Mathesons before you and Susan Canna before you. God, we pray for your spirit to empower the missionaries that you've wound us together with. But even beyond that, Lord, we want to submit to your heart and to your will. Asking how can we be a part of what you're doing around the world. You want to save from every people group. God, may you open our creativity, may you open our hearts, maybe even open the way back to you and H. May you stir passion in our hearts to pray uh, for the window of those people who have never heard about you. God, I thank you that you are a God who saves us from every circumstance. You're saving us out of every uh, ethnic group, every social status. God, may you lift our eyes to see and to worship you for the God that you are, a God who wants to bless and rescue 
from every tribe and every nation and every people group. And may it be so, and may you use us for your purposes and for your glory, even as we worship around your table. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.